lecture for so i'm going to record this lecture for the people who are not here so welcome michael so i'll get started with uh, acknowledging the traditional owner of the land where we meet study and uh, do all the scholarly discourses so i um um pay my respects to your past present, present and emerging so um michael just to give you an idea we have uh, i have invited two classes here what that means is that the uh, lecture recording will be um also um, distributed to two different uh, units and they both are it in education so one is undergrad and other one is a postgraduate course and uh, they have similar content the only difference is that they have uh, the depth of understanding around different topics and uh, their connection to pedagogy is different at uh, different levels in undergraduate and postgraduate. So for um, the students who are attending and who will be watching this, um, Professor Michael um, Colling is also known as Professor Tech. So I will just refer to Professor Ted. And he has been leader in educational technology for over past 20 years. And he was a 2020 uh, recipient of the university's Australia AAUT award for teaching excellence in physical sciences. Is that right? Yep. And is um, an advanced Queensland community digital champion and Australian Society for Computers in Tertiary Education. That's Askelite that I often talk about. He is a community fellow and you are one of the executives now, uh, Michael. Yep. No, so I'm it only- I'm the vice president of Askelite. Vice president, yes. And that means that I got to stay in Askelite for a long, long time if I want to be vice president. And I have to be uh, something around that like technology. Anyway, and he is currently Associate Professor in Information and Communication Technology uh, at uh, um, CQU, yes. <laughs> and um, uh, where he teaches complex educational setting across six metropolitan region, regional and regional campuses. He leads uh, STEM education research in the Center for Research in Equity in Advancement of Teaching and Education. That sounds very scholarly, Michael. Create for short. It might be <laughs> one of those acronyms where they worked out what they wanted to call it and then worked out the words. Mm. And uh, uh, through Create Lab, and I'll uh, let you speak about Create Lab because I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, drives changes through technology and education. Uh, tens of thousands of academic teachers and students have heard his mantras, pedagogy before technology. Oh my God, I don't agree with it. But anyway, whilst learning directly and indirectly from and through his award-winning educational workshops series. And you know, this uh, many of them are also in the school already, Michael. So they might approach you um, to come and give some kind of like workshops on tech or something. So yeah, from, feel free to contact Michael uh, for your school. Um, also while, um, okay, and you are, um, okay, so what is the weaving technology into fabric of the classroom? That's your like uh, workshop series that you run? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Yes, yeah, um, sure. Um, and, uh, it's up there on the, on the that's Weaving Tech, up there. Yeah. Um, and Weaving Tech is a um, is a workshop for K-12 to teachers to learn about technology. It, yeah, so that's the last thing that I, I wanted to say, that uh, you were, like, uh, Professor Tech is a K-12, to uh, involved in K-12 to outreach program for teachers. So yeah. anything that is missing from your large you know identity please uh tell my students and um over to you michael awesome thanks for that Kashmira. and indeed yes Kashmira and i know each other through Ascalite, uh where she probably hasn't told you this but she's a an established 
mentor slash mentee or always a mentor. I can't remember. Oh, well, I was mentee as well. No. Oh, you were a mentee as well. There we go. Of our community mentoring program at Ascalon, which we've been running for 20 years. So she, uh, not Casimiris, but not been in it for 20 years, but the program's been running for 20 years and she's mentored several of the mentees in that program to be better academics and to, to work in this area. So uh, so thank you for that, Kashmir. Right? That's how we know each other. But then, of course, we've seen each other at Ascalon and various other things as well. So I'm going to do the good old the good old slide share. Um, so let me do this. And and then I'm going to do what you always do. And I'm going to do the, do the window jiggle so that I can actually see everybody. And I don't know whether you can see it on these slides, but they do actually move backwards and forwards. But I, you know, I tell you what, I've used these slides a couple of times and it's a very subtle movement. But you might spot the, the dynamic movement in those slides. Yep. And so you, I can yes. see the waves. There you go. There you go. Um, I, I just tell people so that they don't think that they're, uh, you know, uh, they're <laughs> um, so I'm, there's lots of things I could talk to you about, and I'll do a little quick introduction to myself uh, in a second. Kashmir has done a very good job, but I'll tell you a little bit about, about Professor Peck and, and what I do. Um, but Kashmir did want me to talk a little bit here about AI in particular, and I think that's driven by uh, ChatGPT which has been pretty pretty popular these last couple of months, right, in the, in the academy anyway, and I suspect in high schools and, and primary schools as well. We're starting to really worry about what's this, this chat GPT tool going to do to the way that we deliver our assessments. And I, like everybody else in the world, wrote a piece about it, and I'll show you the link to that uh, a little bit later. But there was a week there where every day on my social social media, or I was able to share a new piece that somebody had written about chat GPT for the entire week, basically. So it's clearly uh, sort of taking up the minds of academics and, and teachers. We're worried about what it's going to do to our classroom practice. And that's fair enough. If you've ever had a chance to go and play with it and uh, uh, and, and tinker with it, then you'll, um, you'll know that it's pretty good at answering questions. I ran some of my assignment questions for my unit that I teach through it, and it gave some pretty convincing answers. And you hear that from academics often. They read the answer, what a bad answer. I might even pass that, right? And that's worrisome, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it is... It will be interesting to see how that changes in the next six months. I think often we get a bit excited about some of these tools. And I think as things settle down, we as teachers start to realise how we can actually work those tools into our practice as opposed to kind of panicking about what they're going to do. And so hopefully over the next six months, that's going to change. Um, but it will be interesting to see how that works. And so, yeah, this uh, this set of slides is all about that. This set of slides is about AI theory applications in digital learning. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on, on AI and what it is and what it does. Then I'll talk to you a little bit about what ChatGPT does. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about how we might work that into the curriculum. And Kajmir is 100% right. My, my, my background is as a technologist. Uh, my, my PhD is in technology, all of that kind of stuff that I work with school teachers a lot. I spend a lot of time doing outreach with primary schools and secondary schools. Um, and so I'm pretty across what happens in, in, in uh, primary schools and high schools in the K to 12 sector. And so hopefully I can give you some, some useful advice about how this might fit in. And I think it fits well with that a broad topic of, of new innovative technology. The other thing that I do, and, and Kashmir touched on this, is I, I do a lot of stuff with, with virtual reality and mixed reality and augmented reality. And this one also has a Professor Tech sticker on it because it's all about branding, right? Uh, and we do things like uh, we do workshops with VR and AR and XR. And we go to World Science Festival. I don't know if you can see it there on the wall. Um, that's for, that's for a series of, of events that are run by the Queensland Museum across Queensland in, in Chinchilla and uh, Gladstone and oh, I'm trying to remember the other places. Townsville, Toowoomba, uh, and we go and we put lots of kids in the headsets and, and do all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, so that's the other thing I'm known for. If you don't know me for, you know, for Professor Tech, you know me because I'm the VR or the AR or the MR. Um, I forgot I did that. That's cool, isn't it? 
<laughs> so yeah, we're asking, asking, where are we now? So here's that quick intro slide, uh, Professor Who, Professor Tech. Um, I, um, yeah, and I guess I came up with Professor Tech a few years ago, and it, it is predominantly for the kids. You know, when when the kids are, are and I'm working with the kids, I I, I get recognised or acknowledged as Professor Tech. It's just a nice nice brand to use. And so there's the Professor Tech logo on the on the right hand side there. Uh, on the left hand side, as Kashmir said, th this is really if, if somebody asks me to present at something, it's it's either because I'm Professor Tech or because I have this award in um in teaching excellence. This is the Universities Australia. They they recognize me. There's only only one of those awards. In fact I I'm proud to say I'm the last person to have won that award. They haven't given out one since in 2021 or 2022. And it's in physical sciences and related studies, which broadly covers uh, IT and, and, and various other disciplines. That's why it's physical sciences and related studies. In terms of what I do, I'm, I'm an ed tech. I have been for, for 10, 15 years. Um, oh, 20 years, maybe. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, it's really all about connecting education and technology together. And that's what I do, both in my, in my research, as well as in all of that, that outreach that we've been talking about. I'm right in the middle of rebuilding my website at the beginning of 2023. But if you go to michaelacowling.com, there are some links there to, to my profile page and to the Create Lab website, which you'll find at the moment doesn't really work uh, very well. But hopefully, maybe by the time you're watching this recording, if you're watching the recording, it'll it'll work by then. Otherwise, I mean it is on it is on Facebook and LinkedIn and things. Um and as Kashmira mentioned. The Create Lab offers sort of two programs that you might be interested in as, as pre-service teachers. And so this is the plug bit, right? Um, and th so far I've offered these these free of charge. If I can get there, then I'm happy to do them at schools and, and, um, and, and sort of that doesn't cost you anything. The two main programs are um, Professor Tech's Intro to Awesome, it's similar to what I do at, at uh, World Science Festival. It's putting all the kids in the VR headsets um, or it's particular to a particular area that you're interested in exploring. Like we do a space discovery session, for example, where they go on the space station and talk, listen to astronauts and all of those kinds of things. I think somebody recently wanted me to do, oh, I've forgotten now what discipline area we were talking about. We've done, we're starting to talk about doing some First Nations related stuff as well for the Haas curriculum. But then if, as well as that, we also do sort of a general session where we go and stick them in the headsets and they just get a chance to play. And the idea is to, is to expose them to technology and to give them an idea of what this kind of tech could be used for. Uh, the, the mantra for that one is, is building balanced digital citizens, right? I think you might have saw that on the previous slide, right? Um, and uh, although I'm starting to shift away from saying digital citizen, the other one which you might be more interested on in is weaving tech, right? And weaving technology into the fabric of the classroom is it's we've run nine weaving tech workshops over the last three or four years. We were originally sponsored or funded by Google. These days we tend to be funded by uh, schools or my university will, will sometimes fund us to do those things. And that's actually for K to 12 teachers to come along and learn a little bit about technology. And so I talk a bit about pedagogy before technology and Kazmira and I are probably gonna have a conversation about that at some point it would appear. But um, but I talk a bit about that model and how that works. I talk a little bit about, uh, so we have it, uh, some invited speakers, some fellow school teachers sometimes that wanna talk about these things. And then we also have a hands-on session where you get a chance to play with the VA headsets and the drones and things like that. The idea of it is that it's quite broad you get a chance to experience all of these different things, put all these ideas in your mind. I want to send you away and I want you to have a light bulb moment where you go, hey, I could use VR to do this, or I could use drones to do that in house, or I could use you know, robotics to do this in mathematics. And then when you do that, I want you to come back to me and say, hey, you're an educational technologist. How do I actually do this? Um, and so that's what Weaving Tech's about. And we usually do it, we've done it in individual schools, but we sometimes also do it in a location like in Mackay, right? And then all of the schools in Mackay kind of come to, in, there's this new Mackay campus. And then, uh, and then we get school teachers from those schools. And it's for any school teacher, it's not necessarily for STEM school teachers, although you guys are doing IT 
uh, in in uh, in education at the moment, but it's for teachers that may end up as just general teachers. They're usually there because they're a little bit disenchanted with technology, more excited with technology. Really, IT teachers have seen it all before. Um, so they're the two programs. So that's the plug, right? That's the plug bit. And if you want to know more, touch base with me. We're more than happy to have a conversation with you. Um, I know some of the people up at Charles Darwin, so you never know. I could maybe do dual purpose, head north. Yeah, um, we'll see how that goes. Um, but what I really wanted to talk to you about today is is chat GPT and artificial intelligence and why um, why we're worried about it and maybe give you a little bit of background about what it does and then kind of talk to you a little bit about what we might do with chat GPT. And I, I started sort of digging into this um, and I kind of found this great little picture which gives you a really good idea of of how complicated this whole space is. And I don't know if Kashmiro realizes this, but my doctorate was actually in signal processing and neural networks. And so when they, so artificial intelligence, that's where I got my PhD in. And um, and so when everyone started talking about chat GPT, I went, oh, I know a bit about this, <laughs> right? And so, you know, at some point, if you want to, we could spend some time kind of defining, uh, you know, I, feel free to ask me, well, Michael, what's a back propagation neural network? Or what do we mean when we say field feed forward neural network? Or actually, I don't know what a spike neural network is, but a lot of these things I could give you some details on. The reality is that from a teaching point of view and from a student point of view, and even to a certain extent from what a lot of my students do these days, it doesn't really matter so much how it works. It's more about what you can do with it, right? You feed in the stuff and you get an output from the machine and, and it does something magical. And the magical thing that's happening in the middle for our purposes is not that important unless you're a guy that got his PhD in artificial intelligence. Then you need to know what's happening in the middle. And so rather than talking about all these terms, I thought what I'd do instead, oh, there's the source for that one. I thought what I'd do instead is focus a little bit more on what it can do. Well, I'll tell you just briefly what artificial intelligence can do in general in your classroom, because I think that's important. There are some really interesting applications for artificial intelligence in the classroom. And then we'll we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these AI text generation uh, tools or AI art generation tools, uh, which I broadly term AI to creativity tools, although there's an argument as to whether there's creativity there or not. Um, so, Back when I was a PhD student um, and I was learning about artificial intelligence, uh, I understood uh, artificial intelligence to be predominantly about uh, the machines understanding the world around us. And the way that they actually do that is they actually recognize patterns. And they recognize those patterns in various different ways. They look at images, they look at speech. Uh, you would know you can do fingerprint recognition, face recognition, gait recognition. Um, scene analysis, natural language processing, processing, all of those things are just the machine identifying those kinds of patterns. But what makes it really interesting is that the machines, as, as they stood when I was a doctoral student, and, and to a certain extent, uh, this is still the case, they're not really smart, right? They're not... Uh, they're not machines that, that, that know anything that are inherently intelligent. Instead, they've just taken all of this data and consumed it. And by consuming all of that data, are able to produce something that appears to be smart. And you see this often when people talk about ChatGPT, right? ChatGPT produces some really interesting results. But when you boil it back, you say, you can kind of say, well, where did it get that from? And how did it arrive at that? And the answer is it's just consumed all of this data from Twitter and Facebook and web pages and various other things in order to generate what it's giving you. And so you hear sometimes people say that ChatGPT, for instance, is not very good at, um, at uh, new stuff, at, at breaking news. And it's because it hasn't had a chance to absorb that existing data. And so when I learned about um, when I learned about neural networks and about artificial intelligence, it was very much this idea of pattern recognition. Give me a minute, I'm just going to turn the lights back on. The outside of having a smart house is it gets too smart and thinks that it's 6.30, so I must be out of the office, right? <laughs> so, um, 
So when I was a student, you know, though, I realized very quickly that this idea of pattern recognition was not really intelligence. And the, the parable that I tell my students now is a, a thing called the Yudoski tank parable. The Yudoski tank parable suggests that these machines are not actually as intelligent as we think they are. And it goes something like this, right? The military was asked to build, or, or researchers were asked by the military to build a artificial intelligence system that had the ability to look at images that were captured from a tank, and based on those images, determined whether or not there were enemy tanks out there in the world, right? So you're looking at images, you're saying, is there a tank in that image or not? And you can imagine how that would be useful for the military. Researchers build this system and they do it by training it with lots and lots of data. So they feed in lots of images of tanks and say, there's a tank in this one, there's a tank in this one, there's a tank in this one. Feed in lots of images where there are no tanks and say, there's no tank in this one, there's no tank in this one. Eventually get a system that is really good from based on the images that they have on recognizing when there are tanks and when there are not tanks. They give it to the military, the military put it in their, on their tank, they go out, they test it, and they identify that the system doesn't work. Sometimes it identifies that there's a no tank there, or there's, there's a tank there when there's no tank there. But worse, sometimes it identifies that there is no tank there when there actually is a tank there. And so the military goes back to the researchers and says to them, this doesn't work. The researchers dig down and they work out what's going on. And they work out that the photos that they took of tanks were on cloudy days. And the photos that they took when there were no tanks were on sunny days. And so the, what they thought they were doing is training a system to recognize tanks. Instead, they were training a system to recognize cloudy and sunny days. And so that gives you an idea of why these kinds of systems are not really intelligent. We can look it up. As I said, it's called the Udowski tank parable. There are probably people that explain it much better than me. But ultimately, these systems are what we have out there in the world today. And whenever you use face recognition on your iPhone or uh, you use a self-driving in your car, you are essentially using these kinds of pattern recognition systems. The other thing that AIs are really good at is forecasting or predicting. Right, so we end up with uh, systems that are able to recognize things like breast cancer, systems that are able to recognize if a tsunami is coming, systems that are able to uh, have a conversation with you in some way, um, and uh, systems that are able to summarize and also do some of this AI creativity stuff that we're talking about. Uh, but again, it's just about feeding in lots of data. If we use the, the breast cancer one as an example, right? The way that a machine recognizes whether or not there's a cancerous tumor in a mammogram is we just feed in thousands and thousands of images of mammograms, just like in the Yudoski tank problem. And we say to it, this one has, this density is cancerous, this one's not. This one's cancerous, this one's not. And we just give it that idea um, and what happens is over time, the machine gets really good at spotting those things. And interestingly, in a way that we as human beings sometimes have trouble understanding because we've given it that level of refinement that it's able to identify cancerous tumors, cancerous cells in a, in a breast scan that we can't identify. But it's just been able to crunch through all of that data and notice the differences in a way that we as human beings can't. And for breast cancer in particular, if you Google it, you'll find out that machines are now better, more accurate at identifying cancerous uh, cells in, in mammogram in images than human beings are better than oncologists. But again, is it really intelligent or is it just crunching through lots and lots of data? And so that's the other thing that it does. And that's where we start to get towards this idea of an intelligent chat system, right? Given you saying something to it, what does it say back to you? How does it process and organize that data that it's consumed to give you an answer that appears to be intelligent? And so that's where we end up with something like that. And they've done it for years. I mean, way back uh, 10 years ago, they built a machine, IBM built a machine called Watson that could win against the Jeopardy champions at Jeopardy, right? So it was better at playing Jeopardy than Ken Jennings and Brad uh, Dourif, I think is his last name, um, who are the two reigning Jeopardy champions. But again, it did it by just crunching all of that data 
and coming up with something that appeared to be intelligent. And again, look it up. There's some videos of Watson playing with Jeopardy that are pretty impressive. Um, and then this one I love, this summarization engine is where it takes the the words that you've written and squishes them down, right? And machines are really good at that as well. They're really good at sort of reducing it by 80%. And that's because the English language is so redundant. It has the ability to sort of pull out those key concepts. And again, it just learns over time by looking at all of this data. And then sometimes you'll hear people talk about AI adjacent technologies like data mining or big data or, uh, you know, smart advertising or those kinds of things. And that's where we dig down and we pull out the data and we try and organize it in particular ways to work out these trends. And sometimes you'll, you'll use artificial intelligence techniques to analyze that data like neural networks, for example, but you don't have to. And that's why I call them AI adjacent, right? They're not, they're not, they're not traditional machine learning, artificial intelligence, but they are, they're an interesting way to look at a big bucket of data and understand something that you don't understand before. And when you look at uh, what Facebook knows about you and what they store about you as an individual, which, uh, which is this secret storage they call a shadow profile, then you start to understand uh, how much, how they're able to make these relationships, how they're able to understand we as, as individuals have a certain amount of cats or whether we're married or not or how old we are or what time we get up in the morning, just based on all of that available data. And so, yeah, this is the image of a, of a shadow profile. And as I said, they kind of le relate to things like um, planning algorithms like GPS and chess and, and things like that as well, uh, which are all about scraping through all of this available data. But it's worth not while well noting again that all of this stuff is not artificial intelligence. And surprisingly, even when we talk about chat GPT, it's, uh, it's AI, we call it artificial intelligence. But if you were to define it as a computer scientist, we still quite often define it as, as narrow artificial intelligence, right? Um, and the things that, and even beyond that, things like uh, robotics, for example, or even, you know, Alexa in your house. I probably shouldn't say that. I, I, it'll wake up. Maybe I should say if I go, if I go computer, then it'll, it'll wake up and turn on my lights. There we go. Um, so, you know, these things aren't even basic artificial intelligence systems. Poor old Boris here on the couch. He's not actually an artificial intelligence system at all. He's a robot, right? He's uh, He may have AI inside of him, but he's not an AI system. Um, but they may, as it says on the slide there, contain some software that has some artificial intelligence within it. And so ultimately, when we talk about AI and when you talk about AI with your students, what we're talking about is we're talking about systems that are really good at understanding the world, sort of, that can forecast or predict, often better than us. They can work with data and they can see what we don't. And they can plan things out and beat the, che the Jeopardy champions at Jeopardy or the chess masters at chess, right? And because of all of that stuff, we often talk about them being intelligent. But the reality is that all of those systems, and indeed the brand new ones like ChatGPT, they still have trouble thinking like a human being. They still have trouble dealing with unexpected situations and they still have trouble making human connections as well. And when you read those articles, all those articles that have come out about ChatGPT recently, you'll find that out, right? People will talk about how they asked the machine and it came up with wrong facts and importantly didn't know that those facts were wrong, right? And it doesn't because it doesn't know. It doesn't understand why, what's right or what's wrong, right? Um, or it would say something that's not quite right, right? Or it would write something in a particular way that felt like it was kind of beating around the bush and not actually getting to the point. And that's because the machines still don't have that innate ability to connect with us as human beings. And we call that the uncanny valley. You might've heard that term before. The uncanny valley is when you're talking to a machine and you talk to it for a while and then you realize that that's actually a machine 
you know, you're on the phone and, and you're talking to something. Maybe more likely you're on the chat, talking to the Telstra support chat. You go through it for a while and you go, this is not a person. This is a computer, right? And if I asked you why, you'd struggle, right? I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. That's the uncanny valley, right? The uncanny valley is this idea that there is just still stuff there where it doesn't quite make that human connection yet. So, so how does all of this stuff relate to chat GPT? Well, hopefully I've kind of made a case that you shouldn't be scared of the machines, right? Uh, the point of, of what I've been talking about is a couple of things. Number one is I, I want to give you some tools. It's a bit like weaving tech, a few tools, a few ideas for what you might do in your classroom, right? You know, the kinds of things you might talk to students about, things you might explore a little bit more if you're interested in doing this stuff in your classroom. And B, I want to give you the idea that, that artificial intelligence ain't that smart after all, right? And my students will tell you that. It's still narrow artificial intelligence. But it's fair to say that in December, uh, the end of last year, leading into this year, ChatGPT has kind of thrown the, what did I say on the internet? It's thrown the cat amongst the pigeons, the teaching cat amongst the learning pigeons, I think is what I said on the internet. Um, it's it's made us start to worry. It's made us start to think, oh, maybe these machines do have the capability to do some of our assessment tasks. Maybe they do have the capability to do some of the stuff that we um, that we typically ask students to do. And it's a genuine concern, right? So what is ChatGPT? Why are we all so worried about ChatGPT? And it's funny, this technology has actually been around for a while. And before we started to talk about chat gpt we actually were talking about ai art generators before that so dali you might remember was a good example of an ai art generator and the idea of the ai art generator is that you you go in there and you say hey could you please generate me a piece of art that is you know a cat wearing a hat with a stick of celery on it in the style of you know uh Picasso, right and it generates a a piece of art that looks like that but again, you have to give it some sort of prompt. You have to give it a prompt and then it generates that piece of art. And I stole this picture here on the right-hand side from the New York Times. And this picture is actually from an article in the New York Times where, that, where it was submitted to a competition and actually won an art competition, right? And the, and the author said, well, I, you know, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. I typed in the prompt. It generated that art. I then submitted that art. You thought that art was creative enough to win your art competition, right? So, um, so that was that's Dali, and then these various other sort of uh, AI art generation tools. But what's really thrown the cat amongst the pigeons is ChatGPT, which is basically the same thing, but for text. So you go to it, you pro provide it with a prompt, and um, you you say, hey, can you generate me some words on such and such, you know, on, on you know, how, how people should deal with chat GPT in learning and teaching, right? And it will generate us, you know, however many words you ask it for on that particular topic. And now you've got a little bit of an understanding, I think, even from me just talking to you a couple of minutes, how it does that, right? It goes and it scrapes all of this data together and sort of combines it together in an interesting way to give you that 300 words that you need on whatever topic you asked it about. But what's really interesting about ChatGPT, the reason people are, uh, are really interested in is, is not only good at just sort of regurgitating information, but it's actually really good at generating new ideas. Like, one of the assignments for my uh, for my unit is take a scenario and analyze it using an ethical theory. And I was able to ask ChatGPT to build a scenario for me, which it did. I was then able to ask it to explain Kantianism, which it did. And then I was able to say, use Kantianism to analyze the scenario you just gave me. And it did, and it actually did a half decent job. And so it's that ability to combine those things together that is really interesting. And I think it's what people are really worried about when we start talking about chat GPT in the classroom. And so uh, if you want to have a go at it, I'm not going to, I, I won't do it because at the moment they are changing um, 
they are changing the way it works. So uh, I think if you go there, you might find that it's all oversubscribed. But if you go, so live demo is always dangerous, right? But if you go to chat.openai.com, is it .com or .org? I can't remember. I think it's .com. Um, then uh, you can actually try ChatGPT for yourself. You'll get the top, you'll get the text interface, and you can provide some of those queries. Just bear in mind that if you, uh, yeah, there we go. Kashmir, Kashmir has posted a nice, nice clickable link into the chat for you. Um, if you go there and you try it out, just bear in mind that it is a learning machine that takes all of your data and crunches it, right? So if you go into that machine and you type in all of your assignments, then you're giving it clues and practice on, on getting a good answer for your assignment, right? So just bear that in mind. And my university just recently released something where they said uh, they told people not to put their assignments in chat GPT. Basically, we don't want to feed the machine is what they were worried about. Computer. So um, so the question then becomes, OK, well, if uh, if we're interested in working with chat GPT, what should we do? Should we try and stop students from actually using this technology or should we should we embrace the technology? And this is where I actually felt the need to write something about it, right? So this link here is actually in the Campus Morning Mail uh, and the article we wrote is actually called Regulate or Liberate. And I'm, a, uh, I'm an ed tech, as you know, Columbia is a learning designer and Stephen Colburn is a uh, lawyer. Right, so Stephen came to me and said, well, what should we do? Is it, are these systems actually illegal? I said, we should write something about it. <laughs> so we, we wrote a little bit about it and, and whether or not we could regulate these tools. And the challenge is that it's very difficult, right? We, it's a bit like contract sheeting, right? It, it's, it's, it's new novel content. It doesn't come up in plagiarism software. It's actually a little bit difficult for us as authors to read it, as markers to read it and work out that it's written by ChatGPT. And Stephen backed that up. It's not actually illegal, right? It's, it's, it, there's, the laws just haven't caught up. And so even if we did catch it, I mean, maybe it's against the code of the school, but is it actually illegal? No, not currently. Um, and so, yes, uh, uh, Joy in the chat is 100% right. Michael is team liberate, right? That's right. So my argument is that instead of, uh, instead of, trying to do this, which I think ultimately turns into a bit of an arms race where you're trying to squash it and then the system gets better and the authors of ChatGPT have already told us that they're bringing out new versions that are going to be even cooler, uh, even fancier, right? We're just going to end up in this sort of inevitable arms race. Instead, what we want to do is we want to try and um, we want to try and build something that that is... Uh, takes advantage of chat GPT for our students. Um, and in doing so, we address all of those concerns that are on the slide. And we've kind of touched on some of these already. Uh, misinformation is one. Kashmira mentioned in the chat that it gave her the wrong references, right? That that actually does happen a lot with chat GPT. It gets the fact wrong. But if you're a student that doesn't know the area, you don't know that the fact is wrong, right? So you just roll with it. And that's dangerous. Um, of course, plagiarism and academic integrity, although, as I said, is it plagiarism? Well, the jury's still out on whether it's actually plagiarism or not. But most importantly, I think for us as academics and teachers, right, the biggest issue is, is that it's underlining our assessment strategies and underlining our learning. And, and that's because we write certain assessment questions in a way that it's easy for the student to answer, but in doing so, we sometimes make it easy for the artificial intelligence to answer as well. And there are lots of good reasons that we do that. If you're a subscriber to good old fashioned Bloom's taxonomy, right? The low level questions that we ask in Bloom's taxonomy are about defining things and, and, and are about the students actually being able to, to rabbit back a definition, but, in the case of ChatGPT, it's also really, really good at that. So if you pose a question to students and say, you know what, you know, what year did the first fleet arrive? Well, then, you know, they could just go and type that into ChatGPT and get the answer straight away, right? So uh, so we, we need to do that. And then, of course, uh, we need to work out other ways to evaluate some of those more tricky skills as well. I mentioned before that our system is really good 
at uh, at solving problems and analyzing things. ChatGPT is actually really good at again, if I use Bloom Taxonomy, the apply level of the taxonomy, right? And because it's really good at applying stuff, we need to work out slightly different ways to address that with our students so that they don't just type out questions into ChatGPT. So I gave you a whole bunch of questions down the bottom there. One of them is the one that we asked in our article, should ChatGPT be regulated? Uh, should we as a higher education and education in general fund plagiarism detection vendors in an arms race against AI? Turn it in would say yes. You can come to our Turn It In thing next month for Ascolite, actually, um, and, and ask that question if you'd like. You know, are they going to, what are they going to do about ChatGPT? Um, and whether we should, as teachers, should use the tool. And, and yeah, so the spoiler alert, Michael thinks we should just use the tool. So what do we do? Um, well, the first thing I want to do is is note that we um, that we don't panic. Right. So uh, don't panic. Don't don't fear. Right. Really, when you think about it, this is just a tool for, for learning. And once I think some of the, the shine wears off it, it won't be too dissimilar to those other major changes that have happened in education over the last however many years. Right. You know, and I know it's a passe thing to say, but um, it's the equivalent of introducing the calculator into the classroom. Right. Can you imagine, you know, when they did when they were doing all of their math by hand and then somebody came up with a calculator? And can you imagine all the teachers at the time in the 1970s or something going, these handheld portable calculators, they're going to be the death of mathematics. All of our kids are not going to be able to do basic mathematics because of the calculator. And instead, I guess what probably happened is we as educators, not, not me, I'm not that old, but educators in general learned how to work the calculator into their classroom. They changed the way that their assessment worked and they made it so that the assessment worked with the calculator instead of trying to fight against the calculator. And yes, that sometimes means that you drag students into a room and say, you're not allowed to use any calculators for this particular task. But it also sometimes means that you say to students, like I just did with you with AI earlier, that the, the way it works inside is not that important. What we're interested in is you applying these skills, even if you don't totally understand these skills, but if you can apply them properly and get an answer, then that's what's important. And uh, Conrad Wolfram uh, calls that computer-based mathematics. And he's got a really good book, which I've got sitting around here somewhere called The Math Fix where he talks about this idea that uh, that we maybe need to teach kids less of the theory of math these days and more about the application of mathematics and why the theory is less important. You can look Conrad up. He's, he's the younger brother of Stephen Wolfram, who you may know as, as Bill uh, Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha and various other things. Um, so that's the first argument I'm going to make is don't panic. Um, and I and, and this article here was out in the campus morning mail this week from a guy called Merlin Crosley. He's the deputy vice chancellor academic at the University of New South Wales. Uh, and I thought it was a really good article. And you can see it in the stub, right? Technology is nothing without great teachers. He made that really good argument for us. But let's say you are worried about it and you you want to say, well, what do I do, Mike? You know, um, I think the key here for me is in the Akara Digital Pet. Uh, pedagogies curriculum. Digital, I've written pedagogies there, the digital technologies curriculum. I got the wrong word. Um, and the digital technologies curriculum and, and all its derivatives, like the ones that they have in various different states and things like that, is really interesting in that it's actually built with this idea of iterative improvement in mind. Uh, and so I think if we look at that curriculum, we really understand how it works. And I'm glad to hear that I'm talking to a class that's all about IT and education because hopefully you're very across that curriculum, then I think what we can do is we can think about ChatGPT as a tool to actually help this iterative process. And I love the digital technologies curriculum because it, it has its basis in design-based thinking. So just a, a, a little um, a little bit of an aside, just for a moment. I, I do a lot of research in this area, in design, uh, uh, in design thinking, and I don't actually I'm sorry, I don't do research in this area. All my research is based on this idea of design thinking. And uh, this is the model that the uh, digital technologies curriculum is based on. It's the 
is the design thinking model, design thinking 101, this idea that we understand something, we explore it, and then we, we test it and we evaluate it, and then we loop back around and around and around, understanding the problem, proposing a solution, testing the solution, and evaluating the result over and over and over again. And my research is the same. It's called design-based research. And in design-based research, you do the exact same thing for research purposes. You try something in the classroom, like a fancy new VR headset, um, uh, to solve a particular problem. Um, you work out how well it worked. And then based on that, you iterate it back around and you try again. And if you look at the ACARA curriculum, um, then it actually has that built in right? It has that idea built in, right? So you've probably seen this slide before. This is the sort of the one page of digital technologies curriculum for foundation to year six. And there's another one as well that goes on further on. I just pulled the one for the primary school kids. Um, and you've probably seen this before with all these little boxes that describe what you do at the various different levels. I'm going to draw your attention to these ones here on the left hand side. And I'm going to connect them back to you to that idea of design thinking and design-based research. And what I've done is I've actually made them bigger so you can see them a little bit better, right? So there they are on the right-hand side. Hang on a minute. Computer. And um, you can see that what we're actually doing here is we're actually going through and doing very much a design-based thinking process. So we investigate and define. We generate and design. We produce and implement, we evaluate, and then we loop back around and we do it again. And then the bottom box is collaborate with other students, right? Work together as a team. And DBR actually has that as a core tenant as well. Um, and what's really important about that um, is that that gives us an opportunity to check what the students are doing as they do it, right? And encourage them to use tools like ChatGPT if they want, but then bring those tool, those things back and, and evaluate whether or not that's a useful solution. So just like when you use your calculator to do a mathematical check, right? And then have to go, well, did it generate the right answer? Let me do it by hand so I can check it. We can do the same thing with ChatGPT. We can send the students away and we can say to the students, I want you to investigate this problem. I want you to find out a little bit about it. Get ChatGPT to generate some text for you. And then when you come back, I want you to tell me whether or not that text actually makes sense. I want you to evaluate, is it telling you the right things? What's important? What's not so important in what it's actually giving you? and use that as a mechanism that then go through and do your design. And again, if you want to go away and, and get ChatGPT to help you with the design and come back and, and then evaluate that design, hopefully ChatGPT can't help you with the implementation, right? Although it's not too bad at writing program code at Python and Java code, but then eventually you get back to evaluating and hopefully you do that on your own as well as a student. Um, so we have the ability to help students to understand how they can use it in that framework. And the fact that the digital technologies curriculum is built around this design thinking really gives you those stopping points, right? Those points where you can stop and you can evaluate what the system is actually giving you. And despite what they say, there is still value in, in evaluating it and there is still value in getting the prompts right as well. I read a really recent article about a kid that used uh, ChatGPT to generate his whole assignment, which I think got a, a marginal pass. But then when you dug into the article, he didn't just go into ChatGPT and say, write me 1500 words and submit them. To get a good assignment, he actually had to go in and type various different prompts and tailor his prompts to get the right answers that he could then compile together into the assignment that he actually submitted. And so there is still value in kind of doing that evaluative step and then going back and adjusting the prompts. But what we're doing, what I'm proposing, is that we use the tool as a way to enhance their learning as opposed to, uh, um, and yeah, that means you're going to have to change your questions. You can't just ask them what time the first fleet arrived, what year, because that's not going to work, right? We've got to have a better mechanism to do it. But luckily, the digital technologies curriculum already allows for that kind of work. Um, so yeah, that's what this slide says. This slide says, let's help our students develop prompts for investigating, designing, 
producing and evaluating. And as I said to you, producing and evaluating chat GPT is not very good at that. So that's a really good spot where our students can do some of the work. And essentially what we can end up doing is working with chat GPT and the AI creativity tools and not against them. Now, I know that what I'm saying to you is pretty pretty broad, right? And eventually, I'm, I'm sure we've got to sit down and we've actually got to develop some lesson plans. We've got to think about how this actually works. But it's a bit like the Weaving Tech Workshops. All I want to do at this stage is really give you an idea that it's not all that scary, uh, really explain to you a little bit about how it works and what it does, and then maybe give you the starts of some ideas of what you might do to work with the tool as opposed to against it. And then as you go along, if you if you do come up with some great ideas, then touch base with me and I'm more than happy to, um, to, to talk to you about it a little bit more. I also acknowledge that um, that some of the other questions that I put on the slide previously, I don't have the answers to. And I'm gonna be really, it's called intellectual candor, right? The things I don't know, there are things I don't know. Is using chat GPT cheating? It depends on which state government you ask. <laughs> The South Australian government says it is. The New South Wales government says it is, but the Queensland government says it's not, right? And, uh, you know, different governments have made different rules over the last couple of months. They're all really worried about it. What models exist for AI-enabled assessment? The answer is not many. There are lots of curriculum uh, and resource advices out there for using a calculator in your math classroom. There are none for using an AI-enabled generation tool in your in your English classroom or your Haas classroom, right? Um, and how might it affect the broader curriculum? Uh, how might it affect ICT general capabilities, Haas, science, et cetera, et cetera? I don't know. Uh, really interesting, I think, and this is Michael thinking as a researcher, we've made such a big deal about getting ICT outside of the STEM classroom into English and into math and into Haas, right? We call that ICT general capabilities. That's but if a chat GPT has the idea the ability to replace some of those capabilities to generate some of the stuff for you, maybe we've wasted our time pushing all of that stuff out. We've got the tools now that can do some of that stuff and the and the ICT kind of goes back into the steam or the digi design or whatever it is classroom. I don't know. Still thinking, right? A lot we don't know yet, but we can work it out together. You guys are pre-service teachers. You're in a prime position to start thinking about all of these things, and thinking about uh, how this might work in your classroom. So what have I talked about? Um, I've talked about AI being used for all sorts of things. Automation, pattern recognition, forecasting. I've talked about AI creativity tools. And hopefully I've made the case that it's just a tool. Don't be scared, it is just a tool. And that I think we can redesign our assessment to suit these AI creativity tools. Having said that, I very much acknowledge that we're talking about it three months in. And so uh, there are lots of questions that still need answers. And I think as pre-service teachers, uh, you're in a great position to, to work all this stuff out. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what happens. And there's the picture, that's Professor Tech in the plane I showed you before on the pin. Um, but uh, consider that your flying introduction and hopefully it makes sense. And I'm more than happy to have a chat to anyone about any questions that you might have. I'm gonna turn the lights back on again. Computer. Awesome. Okay, that's it. That's it for me, Kashmir. I'm gonna stop sharing the slides. I can see you've got your hand up already. More than happy to answer any questions you have or any questions that anybody else has. Yeah, so I was just um, uh, reading the chat and uh, Michaela is asking, like, why do we consider that as cheating as long as students learn? Hmm. That's it. No, 100%. Michaela is 100% right. Uh, we uh, Is it cheating? No except that when we ask the students one of those descriptive style questions, we don't anticipate that they're gonna use one of these tools to answer it, right? So in the same way that if, if I asked you one of those descriptive questions and you copy and paste something off Wikipedia, uh, I guess we would consider it cheating because our expectation is that the students would answer it. Um, would answer it themselves right mm -hmm. but the problem is if you're not if you're not limiting them in that way it's just like you know uh like the academic who sets an exam 
does that used to be closed book he changes it to open book but doesn't change any of the questions well of course the students are going to look those things up we're just humans right um and so i think yeah it's uh it's it's is it cheating no i don't think it is it just depends on how we how we think about georgia it. is saying um i'm so nervous because kids are going to know so much more than me well that's interesting that georgia should say that because um the the reality is they don't right we there was this there was this narrative maybe 20 years ago right this guy called mark prinsky he started to talk about how all all kids younger kids were digital natives and all the old people like us were digital immigrants right and he said digital natives have neuroplasticity uh, they're so much better at dealing with technology and all of those things they're just natively better at it than we are right and then over 20 years, we identified that whilst that was true, the digital skills that they were building were not actually useful for the things that we were asking them to do, right? So yeah, totally. The kid that's sitting in your class is better at playing Minecraft and he's better at Fortnite, right? He's better at interacting on Discord. But what we've discovered over recent years is that those skills don't necessarily translate to being better at the things they actually need to be better at for being you know, good digital citizens being digitally empowered so yeah don't worry don't worry too much Georgia um yeah when it comes to the important stuff the learning and teaching stuff I'd, I'd say you're still on top but having said that come to some of my workshops and put, I'll put you in VR and that way you will be uh, you will be mm. yeah I was uh initially I was confused whether uh, to invite you for AI or to refer the VR and AR kind of thing and uh, yeah but um yeah, I think uh, I mean there are no more questions in the in the chat. So I just I'll just stop uh, recording.